let's talk empirical formulas. What are empirical formulas? Basically, all it is is we determine this experimentally and it represents the lowest ratio of atoms of the elements in a compound. So basically it's the simplest formula. So I could have an empirical formula that's just CH. So basically it tells me the ratio of those atoms. So CH would say that I have a ratio of one carbon for every one hydrogen. The actual formula of that compound might be something like C2H2, where I have two of each, but that still distills down into a one-to-one -one ratio. So our empirical formulas tell us what that lowest ratio is. All right, so we can compare this to our molecular formulas. So the molecular formula again tells us the actual number of atoms. So like I was saying, an empirical formula, the lowest ratio could be CH, but then the molecular formula could be something like C2H2. And so the molecular formula ends up being a whole, nother, whole number multiple of the empirical formula. Like if I take CH and multiply the whole thing by two, I get C2H2. Could we ever have an empirical formula and a molecular formula be the same? Absolutely. There are definitely many, many cases where the empirical formula and the molecular formula are the same. For example, something like water, H2O. That's the lowest ratio I can have is two hydrogens to one oxygen. Can't get anything lower than that. Otherwise, I end up with a fraction of an oxygen and I can't have half of an atom. So here's a few examples. So hydrazine is N2H2 or I mean N2H4, and so my empirical formula would be NH2. Peroxide, H2O2, so empirical formula is just HO. Water, H2O, can't get any lower than that, so H2O. Glucose, C6H12O6, so I can divide that whole thing by six and get an empirical formula of CH2O. There's actually a lot of compounds that have an empirical formula of CH2O. Because when I look at that, I get this percent composition data where I get 40% carbon, 6.71% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen. And so a lot of compounds can end up with that same CH2O empirical formula. Formaldehyde, acetic acid, lactic acid, and then um, a bunch of sugars. To get an empirical formula, we do have to determine them uh, experimentally. So... And we do this all the time. If I'm developing or synthesizing something that's a novel compound, when I publish, I have to go through this burden of proof to prove that I have indeed made the compound that I've said I've made. And so there's a lot of different steps we have to take to do that. And one of those is usually sending off for some sort of elemental analysis so then we can determine an empirical formula. And then we have other techniques that help us go from our empirical formula to our molecular formula. So I've had to do this. Um, I published stuff where we made a novel compound that wasn't published. And so we had to go through the burden of saying, hey, no, we actually made what we said we made um, before we could publish our paper. And so usually when you publish something like that, um, if the paper's focus isn't on the novel compound, you talk about what you did with the novel compound in the paper and then um, you have this whole slew of supplemental information that you submit with your paper and since everything's digital now you have the main paper and then people that read your paper can go pull your supplemental information and you have to have the whole burden of proof to say yup I made what I said I made all right so let's try these all right so we'll start with this right here okay so we've got an air pollutant is this colorless pungent gaseous compound that contains sulfur and oxygen. So these sulfur oxide compounds um, are not good for the atmosphere. Uh, they react in the atmosphere and we end up with uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, so, all right. So we have an analysis of this gas. We have a number of grams of sulfur, a number of grams of oxygen. How do we determine the empirical formula? So, as we have discussed before, we can't compare grams and grams because every element has a different molar mass, which means that every element has a different number of grams in one mole. But we know something about moles. We know that there's the same number of entities 
per mole, which is why we compare molar ratios. So what we have to do is we have to convert our grams to moles. And then we have to compare the moles of each compound to each other to figure out the ratio that they fit with each other. Okay, so let's do our sulfur. So I have 0 0.540 grams of sulfur times one mole of sulfur and 32.07 grams of sulfur. So I get 0 0.0168 moles of sulfur. All right, now I have to do the same thing for oxygen. So I get 0.538 grams of oxygen, one mole of oxygen, and 16 grams of oxygen gives me 0 0.0336 moles of oxygen. All right, so I have sulfur 0 0.0168 and I have oxygen 0 0.0336. All right, is that a good formula? No, it's not, because can I have 0 0.03? oxygen atoms? No, I need to have whole number ratios. So how do we get our whole number ratio from this point? What we do here is we divide by the lowest number. So sulfur, we only have 0.168 moles of sulfur. So I'm going to divide both of these by 0.168. Okay, 0 0.0168 divided by 0 0.1068 gives me one. So I have one sulfur. 0.336 divided by 0 0.0168 gives me two, so I have two oxygens. So my empirical formula is SO2, all right? These numbers work really, really well, okay? There's going to be some oddball cases, and I'm going to show you what happens when we get some oddball cases, but if I did my division and I ended up with like, I don't know, 1.9, I did something wrong. I can't just round that to two. Okay, so these numbers work extremely well. Now, what happens if I have percent composition? What am I going to do in this situation? Well, we just talked about percent composition being mass of part over mass of whole times 100. So let's say I assume I have 100 grams of my compound. Well, if I have 100 grams, then my mass percent just becomes grams. Because if I have 92.26% of something, and I take the percent out of that, and I have a whole 100, I have 92.26 grams of it. So in percent composition, we just simply use the percent as the gram. So I would have 92.26 grams of carbon and 7.74 grams of hydrogen, okay? Because if I add those two up, I get 100. Oh, so there's my 100 grams of compound, all right? So in my 100 grams there, how many moles of each? So I'm going to take 92.26 grams of carbon, one mole, in 12.01 grams, I get 7.68, okay, 7.74 grams of hydrogen times one mole in 1.008 grams, and I get 7.68. This one's going to be easy. All right. I have to switch to another slide because I don't have enough room to write everything, but we're going to use the same numbers. Okay. So what is our molar ratio? Well, if I do C7.68, H7.68, divide, I get 1 to 1 because 7.68 divided by 1 equals 1. I mean, 7.68 divided by 7.68 equals 1. 
7.68 divided by 7.68 equals 1. So our mole ratio is 1 to 1. So here we get that empirical formula of CH. Okay. All right, let's try another one. All right, so I have some vitamin C. Okay, so we have a percent composition. So again, when we have our percent composition, we assume 100 grams of the compound, and so then we just take our percent, and those become the grams of each element. All right, so we're going to do 40.92% carbon becomes 40.92 grams. Times one bowl. Okay, we end up with 3.407. Okay, 4.58% hydrogen becomes 4.58 grams. Okay, and then we get 4.54. All right, and then 54.50% oxygen becomes 54.50 grams. And we get 3.41. Okay. All right, I'm going to switch to another slide so I have room to do the rest of this because we're going to get a weird number here that I'm going to have to show you what to do with. All right, so we get 4.54. Okay, all right. So I have these numbers here, 3.41 is the smaller number, so we'll divide each of these by the 3.41. And we're going to get this. We're going to get CH1.330. All right, so I mentioned that these numbers work really well. If you get something like 1.9, you kind of did something went wrong somewhere, and that doesn't work. But there are a few things where if you see it, there is something that works, okay? So if you see something that ends in 0.33 or 0.66, we multiply the empirical formula by three. If you see 0.25, You multiply the empirical formula by 4, and if you see 0 0.50, multiply the empirical formula by 2. Okay, so if you see these particular um, fractions or decimals, then you can do a multiplication of the whole empirical formula. And so that these work just fine like that. But if you get something like, I don't know, 0.69, you might have done something wrong. Um, you might see like 0.34 or 0.657 you know, or something. That does round to 6.6. 6. That's fine. But if it's too far off of that, um, you know, if you do like 0.45, that doesn't round to 0.5. These work much better than that. Then something went wrong. But if you do see a 0.33 or a 0.66, you can multiply by 3. If you see a 0.25, you can multiply by 4. And if you see a 0.5, you can multiply by 2. So we have a 0.33 here. So we have to multiply the entire empirical formula by 3, which is going to give us C3H4O3. And so that's our empirical formula, is C3H4O3. Okay? All right, let's try one more. All right, TNT, we get four elements this time, all right? 
So again, percent composition. So we're just going to say we have 100 grams of the compound. So our percentages become our grams of the individual elements. All right. So we have 37.01% carbon. So 37.01 grams of carbon. One mole in 12.01 grams gives us 3.08. Okay, next we have our 2.22 grams of hydrogen. All right, and we get 2.20 moles. Okay, 18.50 grams of nitrogen. In 14.01 grams, we get 1.32. And then finally, 42.26 grams of oxygen, one mole oxygen in 16 grams. And we get 2.64. Okay. All right. So, before you let the video play to the next slide, because I do have to switch to another slide to have room to finish this, I want you to pause and I want you to try to put this together into the empirical formula. Once you've tried it on your own, then I want you to unpause and let the next slide roll. Okay, hopefully you paused it first before you decided to watch this part of the video. All right, when we put it together, we get C 3.08, H 2.20, N 1.32, O 2.64. So our smallest one here is the 1.32. All right, and so what we end up getting is C 2.33, H 1.66 NO2. All right, so this is actually nice in that we have a 3, 3 and a 6, 6, because if you have 3, 3 or 6, 6, then you can multiply the whole thing by 3. So we only have to do that. So I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 3. I'm going to end up with a final empirical formula of C7 H5 N3. Oh, six. All right, so those are our empirical formulas. And so we can take gram amounts or we can take our percent composition data and get our uh, empirical formula from that. There's other ways of getting empirical formulas, but for the scope of this course, we're only going to use these methods. We're not going to use any of the other methods of finding an empirical formula.